Good afternoon and welcome to the second day of Inspiration Forum. Uh, what is part of Ihlava Film Festival, it's fourth year of the forum and the main idea of the forum is to put together filmmakers along with the personalities who are important, uh, who, who, play, who are playing important role in a human interest, but they are not particularly from the film, uh, not only industry, but film as a part of uh, culture. And uh, uh, today we have, we, we are very happy that we are hosting the guests from Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong uh, are now living in very dramatic and turbulent situation. And uh, this uh, uh, umbrella revolution, it is not only the reason that uh, we've invited uh, them. I think that the China is playing the uh, very important role in our days and uh, China is closer than we can expect it. There is a very famous uh, sentence of uh, one of Czech philosopher Egon Bondy who said that within uh, 50 years we could expect that we all will be forced to speak Chinese languages and that we become part uh, of Chinese uh, culture. I don't know whether he was right or not, but only what I can say that he have said it already 20 years ago. So uh, I would like to see this uh, lesson interactive and maybe from our side we will be giving uh, to our dear guests uh, sometimes weird questions but this is part of Inspiration Forum to be inspired from both sides. So I would like to encourage you, please take part uh, to the presentation and, uh, and uh, ask the questions. Uh, so uh, Ivona will now, uh, Ivona is a political scientist and activist herself and she is also my wife. She will be moderating <laughs> this uh, lesson uh, together with me and she will now uh, say a few words about our dear guests. So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon from my side as well. Uh, thank you, my husband, Philip Remundas, for <laughs> first words. And uh, I have this honor to welcome here very special guests from very far away, um, who are uh, Grace and Joseph Cheng. And uh, they, uh, they came here to share with us their experiences, not from only from the last days, but uh, I hope also from uh, their very rich life in the in the faraway part of the world. Um, Joseph is a political scientist uh, chair uh, professor at the City University in Hong Kong, and in the same time, these days, very active, uh, uh, po uh, very active uh, member and one of the founders of uh, Occupy Central, which is this uh, movement uh, uh, of people who would like to convince China to keep their promises. So now, please uh, let them welcome, and uh, I would like to give you a word. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am most, most grateful for this opportunity uh, to come to Czech, to come to Yilava, uh, to share with you our experiences in Hong Kong, our fight for democracy. We certainly need support from the international civil society community. And we understand that although Czech is a relatively small country, you have produced great people. And I would like to uh, open this session with two quotations, which I'm sure you are most familiar with. Your former president, Václav Havel, once said, we must not be afraid of dreaming the seemingly impossible if we want the seemingly impossible to become a reality to become a reality. In Hong Kong, we, we are now trying to dream the impossible dream. Your famous philosopher, Jen Patoka, also once said, the only genuine values are those for which one is capable of, if necessary, sacrificing something. We are making a sacrifice to show that we care. So I shall begin by showing you a, uh, 
a video, three, four minutes, to let you have a feel of what we have been doing in Hong Kong in the past month or so. Thank you very much. People are saying that we are in charge in Hong Kong. This is a great eight student. The chief executive refused to talk to the students and they surrounded the chief executive's residence. The protesters demanded that this square in front of the government buildings belong to them. The police using uh, pepper spray. Joshua Wong, one of the student leaders who is only 18 years old. This old person saying we must protect the students. More than 50,000 student, uh, protesters demanding the release of the students. They are saying the students are innocent. This one pleads that do not hurt the students. So to protect the students, the organizers start, uh, they started the Occupy Central campaign early. Initially, more than 60,000 people turned out. More than 7,000 police policemen came, firing 87 tear gas. This person yelled, please be sober, policemen. We are not your enemies. More than 10,000 protesters now coming out. Oh, sorry, more than 100,000 protesters. This person saying is, we are Hong Kong people, Hong Kong is my home. This young lady is saying that this Siwala administration is incompetent, shameless, using tear gas against unarmed students. This time, the peak, reaching the peak, probably more than 400,000 people came out. The chief executive refused to step down. Chinese officials saying, well, the sun still rises, refusing to give, to make any concessions. Some thoughts are being used by the pro-Beijing groups to attack the students, and the students refuse to talk with the government for the time being. A usual song sung by the uh, protesters. Yeah. So thank you very much. This is the uh, this three minute, three four minute video gives you a feel of what has been happening. And now I try to uh, uh, give you a list of uh, photos, uh, slides, and uh, let you have uh, a sort of a, an account of what has been happening. Uh, Professor Benny Tai, the organizer, and yes, we, we tried to produce uh, uh, English subtitles. And it was in January last year that he started articulating this idea of occupying the central business district as a kind of civil disobedience campaign 
to fight the regime if the regime still refused to grant Hong Kong people a genuinely democratic political system. And uh, following that, the three main organizers, uh, two of them are academics. In the central, Danny Tai, a law professor, uh, on the right-hand side of me, uh, Dr. Chan Ginman, a sociologist, and Reverend Ju, uh, uh, a Christian uh, missionary. Um, protesters protesting in June this year against the uh, white paper released by the uh, Information Office of the State Council in Beijing. This white paper on one country, two systems. This white paper offered a very hawkish line saying that whatever power Hong Kong has, it comes from Beijing. So it was interpreted as a sort of downgrading the autonomy granted to Hong Kong people according to the original one country, two systems model. Okay. The uh, law professionals, 1,800 law professionals, lawyers, judges, they dress in black, they march in silence to protest against the white paper. And uh, they certainly believe that the white paper also undermines Hong Kong's rule of law. Uh, they were standing just uh, in front of the Supreme Court building of Hong Kong. At the end of June, we hold a civil referendum, an informal referendum in which more than 800,000 people voted. Um, about 22% of Hong Kong's registered voters. And the proposal uh, offered by the Alliance for True Democracy won in the civil uh, referendum. To give you some idea, we have a population of 7 million, just 7 million. About 5 million qualify to vote. Normally, a bit more than 3 normally about 3.3 million would register. About 3.3 million would register. The voter turnout rate is usually about 50% or so in our Legislative Council elections. So this simply means that with 800,000, that's more or less, slightly less than half of the usual voter turnout uh, came out to support the uh, civil re referendum, and they all demanded uh, nomination of candidates by civil nomination. That is to say, any candidate who can have 1% uh, of the registered voters support, supporting them, they should become the official candidates. I shall explain the significance a little bit later. Incidentally, I. I am the convener of this Alliance for True Democracy, uh, which was actually s supposed to be formulating uh, the electoral system. But since, uh, well, we have failed to exert pressure on the government to offer us a fair system, uh, our friends, the Occupy Central campaign, took over uh, and organized the civil disobedience campaigns. So July the 1st, there was a pro-democracy march. More than half a million people took part. Um, since July 1st, 2003, since July 1st, 2003, every year on July the 1st, we organize a pro-democracy march. Uh, more than half a million people certainly uh, was a very, very significant number. Here you see the pro-Beijing groups mobilizing people to oppose this, the Occupy Central campaign. They claim to have 1.5 million signatures, but uh, the uh, authenticity, the truth, uh, was certainly uh, far below that because 
somehow they allowed all sorts of people to repeat signatures and so on. And um, in general, we believe that this lacked credibility. But at the same time, uh, we want to let you know that the pro-Beijing groups certainly had a lot of mo mobilization power as well. On August the 17th, again, the pro-Beijing groups mobilized people uh, to protest against the uh, uh, Occupy Central campaign. They claimed that uh, more than 190,000 people had attended. At the same time, the newspapers in Hong Kong, the television stations in Hong Kong, broadly reported that pro-Beijing groups paid people to attend these protest rallies. August the 31st, the Standing Committee of China's Parliament, the Standing Committee of, the, of China's P National People's Congress, made this decision setting the framework for the chief executive election in 2017. This decision allowed no room, no room for a genuinely democratic electoral system. And it was this decision which triggered, first of all, the class boycott organized by the Hong Kong Federation of Students, which later led to the Occupy Central campaign, which you saw in the video just now. Um, the class boycott, the class strike, started from 22nd to 26th of September. Monday to Friday, and they, they are, the placards are saying that they are going to stand firm. They asked the uh, Standing Committee of the National People's Congress to withdraw its decision made, uh, announced earlier. This, this is the campus of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. On the last day, oh, well, um, you know, uh, during one of the days of the class boycott organized by university students, some secondary school students also joined the protest. The secondary students organized a group called Scholarism, led by a very charismatic young leader, Joshua Wong, who made it to the uh, front page, the cover page of uh, Time magazine recently. You might have seen his photo on the cover page of Time magazine two weeks ago, I think. Yeah. Uh, police using uh, pepper sprays on the 27. Uh, and it was this uh, violence which triggered the launch of the Occupy Central campaign the very next day, the 28th of September. So early morning, this is about 1.30, 1 1.30 a.m. Uh, on September the 28th, the organizers uh, announced the launching of the Occupy Central Movement. Uh, they emphasized that this, this was to be a uh, peaceful, nonviolent civil disobedience campaign, and they claimed to Occupy Central with love and peace. So uh, people gathering uh, <laughs> in the central business district, you could see a lot of people. And uh, they used umbrellas to uh, protect themselves against the pepper sprays, uh, giving rise to the name Umbrella Revolution. Again, you might see some of the reporters were also hurt. They also suffered from uh, pepper sprays. Uh, in late evening, September the 28th, police used tear gas, trying to disperse the crowd in the central business area. This really made the people very angry, drawing the crowds, taking part in the uh, protests. 
uh, in the subsequent days. So um, the uh, protesters sort of adopted a kind of guerrilla warfare tactics. They spread to Causeway Bay, uh, a, a, a shopping area, so you could see people moving to other areas. Uh, crowds dispersed and also spreading to Mong Kok, to Kowloon, uh, a, another densely populated area. So these are, are the uh, main areas occupied by the protesters, the Admiralty, uh, Causeway Bay, and Mong Kok. And they are still being occupied today. Today is the 29th day of the uh, Occupy Central movement. So uh, 29th. So um, great numbers of people gathered on the 29th in response to the use of pepper spray and so on uh, in the previous evening during which uh, the police tried to uh, clear the protesters. So you can see the tall buildings in the central business district and the, the Victoria Harbor. Uh, on the other side is Kowloon. Again, uh, the students um, attended the National Day celebrations, protesting. Uh, Joshua Wong again appeared. Oh. <laughs> a protester, a protester showing uh, help, <laughs> sheltering the policeman from the rain. Uh, a piece of street art on October the 6th. Uh, the uh, use of thugs uh, mobilized by the pro Beijing groups to attack the uh, protesters. These were attempts to discredit the campaign because uh, uh, they tried to, to provoke the protesters using violence, hoping that uh, there would be a, uh, a violent uh, response. Uh, we do not have concrete evidence of police uh, using the facts, but if you go through media reports in Hong Kong, there are many incidents of pro-Beijing groups using triad members because they were the usual people who could easily be bought with money. And... Uh, and at least the police were guilty of tolerating the use of uh, gangsters. So uh, in mid-October, uh, some of the protesters used the, uh, the usual Hong Kong art of building using bamboo poles to build barricades uh, in the main protest area at Roti. People sleeping in Mong Kok area, again showing some of the barricades. Uh, police used violence, kicked and attacked a, a handcuffed protester on October the 16th. Again, uh, the scene was captured by a television reporter. It was broadly uh, circulated. Uh, this certainly discredited the police and made the protesters quite angry. Uh, some police officers attacking unarmed protester. Uh, the first talk between Hong Kong Federation of Students representatives and government officials. This, of course, represented a significant breakthrough. The central government in Beijing, the Hong Kong government, the pro-Beijing groups, the business community, they had all been condemning the Occupy Central campaign since the beginning of last year. Now they agreed to talk. Uh, this certainly meant that the protesters had won some recognition, uh, had won some uh, concessions from the government. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much for, for this presentation. The first, questions, first question appearing in my head after this is that protests and revolutions are not what they were before. Uh, this technique of um, organizing a protest against the protest is something I see very new. Uh, uh, in the history, there is uh, there is this technique to pay people or to organize uh, unnaturally people to come against uh, the protesters in the way it looks like this is not the clash between the government and uh, Democrats, but this is the clash between people and uh, there are this group A and group B and uh, we officials, we government, we police, we don't we don't have anything to do with that. Uh, I know from my own experience how difficult this is because then the people really see it as a conflict between two groups in the society. Who are these people uh, in Hong Kong? Who are these thousands or tens of thousands of people who are protesting against uh, you? We are under a lot of pressure. In the first place, we believe that all of our groups are being infiltrated. So our phones are being hacked, uh, our, are being tapped, our computers uh, are being hacked, and so on. Actually, we have to operate on the basis of we have no secrets. We can't keep secrets. Our meeting minutes are, uh, were, were usually stolen and circulated. And, and so on, um, because we realize we are fighting against a huge state machinery. This state machinery had the technology of tapping our phones, hacking into our computers, and so on. And then, of course, we have to admit that the pro Beijing groups have very substantial resources of mobilizing people. Um, it is genuinely understood that the Pro Beijing United Front uh, has been organizing probably 4,000 to 6,000 uh, so-called patriotic organizations, which could be mobilized to support the government, to take part in pro-government rallies, to, uh, to say that they are against Occupy Central and so on. To, um, on the basis of public opinion polls, uh, it has been roughly shown that uh, about 45% of the people, they oppose the decision made by the uh, Standing Committee of the National People's Congress 30% supported, 30% supported, and that still left about 25%, a quarter of the population uh, remaining rather undecided. Now, um, who are these people who said no to the Occupy Central campaign? Um, one has to admit that among the people, there there is a segment of the population who maintains a rather compromising attitude. They will say, well, democracy may be good, but democracy cannot fill our stomachs. Or we are so dependent, our economy in Hong Kong is so dependent on the economy in mainland China. Even water in Hong Kong has to come from mainland China. Who are we to confront Beijing? We, we, can't, we can't fight Beijing, and at the same time, we are a part of China. China has been changing. The economy of China has been doing extremely well. Uh, the status, the influence of China have been uh, improving. We should be proud of being a part of China, etc., etc. So we have to admit that at least... Uh, uh, Thirty percent of the population uh, hold these views, and uh, the typically the uh, pro Beijing groups do have the mobilization power. It is widely reported, for example, by the media in Hong Kong, that these groups would a 
provide transport, free transport, uh, a a uh, rather luxurious lunch <laughs> uh, for people taking part in the protest rallies, and the payments usually range from. 200 to 500 Hong Kong dollars per head. So that's roughly about 20 euros to 50 euros per head uh, taking part in those rallies. So um, uh, this kind of tactics of using um, in Chinese communist terminology or in communist terminology is a kind of using masses against the masses. And uh, it is especially Worrying uh, from our point of view. Uh, we understand that protests of this kind cannot last forever. Uh, protests of this kind do create a little bit of disturbances to the people. And in a place like Hong Kong, the typical argument is we, we've got to live, uh, the economy has to run. So you guys are. Uh, hurting what you have been doing is hurting the economy. We can't survive. It hurts everybody, and so on. So these are the usual arguments being raised. And my next question would be: um, What is really rare and special about the movement in Hong Kong is how many young, so young people are active in the movement. Be really hardly imaginable for me in Czech Republic that so many students between 15 to 18 being uh, um, protesters or even being leaders of the of the movements uh, in this country these kids are usually uh, don't they are not taking care of the politics what's what's so what's raised them what uh, you know what's the motivation of these people in many ways young people are the most idealistic groups in the community. Um, we have been trying to compare them to, say, um, the, uh, the young child in the famous story of the Emperor's New Clothes. So the young kid being naive, can come out and say the emperor has no clothes, whereas ordinary people, for various reasons, they are more restrained from speaking out. They have to worry about their jobs. Um, they they have to uh, think about the dangers of taking part in a protest, uh, which may bring them, which, which may get them arrested which may bring them a criminal record. These may hurt their careers. They may lose their jobs and so on. So that is why so, so many young people have come out. And typically, those who are in support of the protests tend to be the younger people as well as the better educated people because they naturally care about democracy, human dignity, human rights, freedom, equality, and so on. They are more willing to make a little bit of sacrifice uh, for, these, for these values. Um, young people also, to some extent, suffer more uh, because of the social injustices. Um, in many parts in East Asia, we are a bit like Europe today, so you have higher unemployment rates for the young people. Um, we are a bit different from Czech or Eastern Europe or Europe in general in the sense that the labor market in Hong Kong is very flexible. So wages can go down a lot, so that most of the young people still have jobs, but jobs without any future, jobs with very low wages, and so on. So young people are getting fairly angry because they see a decline in the 
upward social mobility opportunities, more limited job prospects, and above all else, because of the high prices of housing, they they almost think it is hopeless for them to have their own accommodation, and this means that their marriage plans, their plans of having families are being adversely affected. Um, let me give you some concrete figures. Um, our median salary, median salary of fresh graduates is about 11,000 Hong Kong dollars a month, which means about uh, uh, 1,200 euros a month. Uh, or uh, this, no, no, that's about well, roughly about the eleven hundred, the eleven hundred. So one thousand one hundred euros a month for a young grad, for a fresh graduate. This actually means that he has to go back to his parents to eat <laughs> and to sleep. Otherwise, he he or she can hardly survive. Now, starting salaries may not be a very important thing. You they can get uh, better prospects. But normally, the salaries will stay at uh, uh, 1,500 euros a month, even after five, six years. Uh, so you can see the difficulties. Um, they, also, they are also in debt to the government, too. Um, they pay about... Uh, they pay tuition fees while attending university. So they normally have to borrow from the government. Uh, so uh, uh, in Hong Kong, they pay about uh, 42, 43,000 Hong Kong dollars per year for tuition fees. They have to borrow another 20,000 Hong Kong dollars per annum for, for ordinary expenditure. So after a four-year degree, to cut the story short, they are roughly um, 25,000 euros in debt. So after graduating, you are in debt. 25,000 euros in debt. And then you earn uh, about 1,100 euros a month. So you can see quite a bit of anger. Um, Hong Kong, in the past 10 years and more, realized um, a, an expanding gap between the rich and poor. Among all the big cities in, Hong, in the world, among all the big cities in, Hong, in the world, Hong Kong is the one with the widest gap, with the biggest gap between the rich and poor. So we are number one in this area, unfortunately. And certainly there has been a lot of collusion between big business and the government. And... Uh, increasing corruption as well. Uh, if I may ask, uh, I'm interested in the anatomy of the protest. Uh, besides the fact that people are occupying central areas in the city, is there any other uh, mean of protest? Uh, maybe some street art or, or art in public space? Is it being used that... Uh, uh, is there are there tools are these kind of tools are being used uh, by the artists but also protesters uh, or additionally are there some documentary films dealing with that or some humorous cartoons coping with the pro Beijing propaganda? We do not yet have documentary films, unfortunately, but uh, as you see, there there were quite a bit of pieces of artwork, a lot of cartoons, a lot of cartoons, a few songs, uh, um, a lot of jokes uh, circulated through the internet. So I do hope that eventually they may have some documentary films. Uh, one or two very serious documentaries have been produced on the uh, Occupied Central campaign, so based on uh, the execution of careful plans. So at least one or two 
very serious documentaries on the Occupy Central campaign uh, have been made. Um, the television stations in the territory have also produced some, some featured stories too. Uh, but a lot of jokes and quips and <laughs> funny statements uh, over the internet, uh, which is quite, quite rich. Um, we hope to have more uh, cartoons. We certainly have seen a lot. And then we also have a, a, uh, a war of statements. So people have written something and sticked onto a wall following the uh, democracy wall tradition in, in, in Beijing. So this has been a lot of that. My next question would be um, about your connections or inspiration by other movements, uh, um, other democratic movements um, around the globe. But in the same time, in mainland, mainland China, there are also movements, not maybe pro-democratic, but pro-environment, pro-social. Is there any connection of uh, Occupy Central and movements uh, around, from all around the world or, or China? Well, in China, within China, the leadership, the authorities were very, very concerned with the dramatic changes in Eastern Europe and the following disintegration of the Soviet Union. Uh, there were a lot of studies made and certainly the Communist Party of China has been studying the impact and the causes of the dramatic changes in Eastern Europe and the disintegration of the uh, Soviet Union. Then the Chinese authorities became very concerned and a bit worried about the color revolutions, the color revolutions. Uh, and again, the official think tanks produce a lot of work on, on color revolutions. And uh, some of the lessons learned from these two important historical episodes were, um, in the case of Eastern Europe, the tremendous influence of the church, of the Catholic Church, and independent trade unions like Solidarity. So as a result, you can see that even today in China, um, the authorities are still very much against the underground churches. The authorities are still uh, uh, very much against independent trade unions. And this is probably a very, very important area of development uh, you see in China. Um, in, as you can see, there has been a lot of exploitation of cheap labor in China. This was, and to some extent still is, a very important point of attraction uh, to attract foreign investment into China. Uh, and uh, the Chinese authorities have been wise enough to tolerate uh, spontaneous workers' protests demanding uh, uh, pay in arrears, better working conditions, and so on. These protests are usually tolerated. However, if anyone tries to form an independent trade union, they will be immediately arrested. So there is uh, a fear that, well, it basically boils down to this. There is a real concern about any challenges to the regime. The regime does not accept any erosion of political power, which is a monopoly in its hands. So any potential challenge will be crushed. 
with regard to the color revolutions, the main worry is about Western influence. Western foundations, civil society groups, sort of supporting civil society groups in China.、Uh, a lot of worry about the internet.、Uh, a lot of worry about foreign NGOs making an impact, supporting NGOs in China.、Uh, there is a story、uh, run about. <laughs> There's a story about this. Round about 2006, Putin met the Chinese president at that time, Hu Jintao, and Putin warned the Chinese leader about the influence of foreign NGOs. And、uh, as a result, shortly afterwards, George Soros went to Beijing, and he was very much cold shouldered.、Uh, his、uh, talk. His scheduled talk in Beijing University was cancelled, and so on. And、uh, from that point onwards, there were many more. There have been more, many more restrictions about activities of foreign NGOs in China. Then, of course,、uh, very briefly, you have the Arab Spring.、Uh, the Arab Spring certainly has taught the Chinese leaders the significance of the spread of the internet、uh, of <laughs> Communications through iPhones and so on. I have a question regarding to the new pro-Beijing、uh, direction of Czech foreign policy.、Uh, Czech Prime Minister signed a contract with the Beijing authorities about the business cooperation, and ex- in exchange for the, the Czech Republic won't continue with the Havel's.、Uh, Political line of criticism of Tibet politics and also human rights rights humiliation in mainland China politics. We will probably have soon direct airline connecting Beijing and Shanghai with Prague. And、uh, there is a recently Czech president touring around around Chinese cities with a group of、uh, Czech businessmen. So probably there will be also some businesses. A、business contract signed soon in exchange for the、uh, foreign policy, as I said. What would you advise、uh, to us, the Czech, to continue with this change of direction, or to think twice what this would mean for us? I am all for trade and exchanges of various kinds, but Chinese leaders. Themselves have been preaching non-interference in the sovereign affairs of other states. That is to say, you has you have to respect the basic positions of foreign states. You certainly see that、um, Chinese leaders are very concerned about. Support for the Muslims in Xinjiang, support for Dalai Lama, and so on, and the Chinese leaders have have been willing to pay the price, so to speak, to create a deterrence effect. Norway is a pretty good example. So far, Norway still suffers from informal sanctions from China. Because of the Nobel、uh, Peace Prize given to Liu Xiaobo, a dissident, this demonstrates that Chinese leaders understand that、um, while it cannot openly、uh, exert too much pressure on Norway, and it is unreasonable, and so on, and yet. It is willing to pay that kind of price. It is willing、um, to try to exert a deterrence effect, and the same applies to European leaders, European governments receiving the Dalai Lama. Normally, Chinese authorities will try to make these governments pay. I un- I can certainly understand that Western governments 
are concerned with concrete benefits like trade benefits, investment benefits, and so on. But、uh, I do hope that people in Western people in Europe, civil society groups in Europe, will act as watchdogs of your own government, so that your government will uphold the values that you cherish. Chinese foreign policy think tanks tend to divide Europe into an old Europe and a new Europe. Old Europe refers to、uh, UK, France, Germany, and so on. New Europe means Eastern and Central European countries. Chinese leaders believe that old Europe is more friendly. Towards China, more pragmatic in the China policies because these major powers tend to look at foreign relations more from a real politic kind of perspective, and therefore they can be persuaded with trade deals and so on. A good example will be. Not too long ago, the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang visited、uh, UK, offering very, very substantial contracts. The idea certainly included the Hong Kong question in mind.、Um, New Europe, of course, remember the impact of communism better. New Europe, therefore. Cares more about universal values such as freedom, human rights, and so on. You know the deceptions of communist regimes much more. For example,、um, four or five years ago, China very much wanted、um, the European Union to lift the arms embargo. Against China, and uh, uh, France, UK, Germany were more willing to lift the arms embargo, but、uh, Eastern European countries certainly、uh, have been less reluctant.、Uh, obviously, it has to do with the、uh, concrete interests. Major European powers have. Armaments industries more eager to benefit from the、uh, export businesses, and、uh, we don't want to、uh, have Professor Jung just for ourselves. So please,、uh, there is a microphone which is ready over there, and so any comments or questions, please. Um. <coughs> Big, uh, a big difference uh, between Hong Kong and、uh, other pro-democracy movements in, let's say, in Ukraine or、um, Arab Spring or even、uh, the Balotna demonstration in Moscow, is that hello, is that um, uh, there, uh, you know, there were people of different ages, different classes. Do you think?、Um, With such a narrow group of protesters, you know, just young students, can it succeed, Unle- or, or does it need to involve, you know, like a wider selection population? Well,、um, most Hong Kong people believe in democracy. Um, public opinion surveys in the past decades or two have been able to demonstrate up to sixty, seventy percent of people in Hong Kong they want to see a democratic system. However, when it comes to willing to the willingness of making a sacrifice, of speaking out, then certainly there there is more hesitation. 
on the part of people who have to work, who have to support their families, and so on. In- incidentally, there are many more. Uh, well, there are a lot of young people there protesting. There are a lot of. There are a substance. There, there is a substantial number of old people too. Exactly because they are retired, there's less pressure on them. And and you see a lot of old people <laughs> protesting as well. We have to admit that it is rather difficult for us to exert pressure on Beijing to change its mind. We understand. The odds. Um, we understand that it is not easy for us to uh, secure concrete concessions from Beijing in the coming two, three years, three, four years. So what we are planning is a very long-term political struggle. We would like to have wave after wave of. Peaceful, non-violent, civil disobedience campaigns. We have to admit that while it is difficult to show concrete achievements, and yet, as long as we do not give up, as long as we continue to fight, at least we don't sacrifice our own principles. And our own dignity. It is not just a struggle to have a democratic system. It is basically a struggle to uphold our our core values, our basic rights, and our dignity. There is an awareness that if we do not speak out today, we may not be even. We may not even we may not be even able to speak out after a few years. We don't want Hong Kong to become just another big city in China. We want to maintain our our free spirit. It is difficult. We don't underestimate the the pressures. There is a question here. Hello, and thanks a lot for for the speech. First of all, I had two two questions. One is about uh, violence and the fact that you chose that violence was not an option. But I was wondering if there is some relationship with some more radical groups that could have violence or violent acts. As an option, and the other remark, it's what do you think? What's your opinion in this rise of democracy in an era where today, especially in Europe, I'm I'm from Italy, so I'm talking about Central Europe, uh, the democratic system and especially the representative democratic system is in in deep crisis for for many people. That's that's the opinion. I mean, the whole policy of the European Union, it's it's really challenging. The possibility of the representative democratic system. So, what's your opinion about that? Thank you. Um, the first question. We shun violence because we can't fight Beijing. We are in no position to fight Beijing. If Beijing is willing to pay the price, it can crush us. It can crush us. So, nonviolence is also a means of self-protection. Nonviolence is necessary to secure the sympathy, or at least the tolerance, of the majority of people in Hong Kong. And to appeal for support in the international community.、Uh, so that is why we have been trying to avoid violence, and I think we are very proud of that. As you can see, when the police fired T 
tear gas at the crowd. People just retreated. They 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 were quite prepared. They so they had bottled waters, washed their faces. <laughs> Then they came back. Uh, they retreated and came back. You notice that even under such circumstances, people did not attack the police. People did not even throw things at the police, and people did not damage the shops nearby. No shops, no shops were damaged nearby. So we appreciate the significance of nonviolence. The second question, of course, is a big, big question. It simply means something like this: democracy is not just a political system; it's not just a voting system. Democracy requires care. Requires commitment, requires participation by everybody. If people really care, if people really participate, like the students, certainly you are not going to have a system in which the rich dominates, in which people have no say, in which politicians only care for your vote. Once every four years, five years, if people care enough, if people really participate, so my appeal remains: democracy is a system which demands a keen sense of participation. Without that sense of participation, democracy may not work. Democracy may be dominated by powerful lobbying groups, by the rich, by those who who know how to play the game of elections. So, <laughs> it requires efforts, and if you don't pay the efforts. If you don't make the efforts, you subsequently pay the price. Are there any more questions? My uh, my question is, or I wanted to ask you, what what would you expect Beijing to be next steps? Like, could you and your colleagues be still in the university in a Five to in seven years, if this goes forward, then I would like to change this question <laughs> in opposite direction. What kind of almost miracle? What what's the best you could think now? What could happen to stop this pressure from Beijing? What what do, would that be? Well, um. We try to argue it this way. We are trying to say to Beijing that Hong Kong people respect China's sovereignty over Hong Kong. We have no intention to challenge the central government in Beijing. However, please leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> By leaving us alone. There may be some good benefits for Beijing. You, you, in the first place, Hong Kong becomes more governable. We are telling Beijing that if you don't give Hong Kong a democratic system, the Hong Kong government has no legitimacy in the eyes of the people. If you find it extremely difficult to govern effectively. And this is going to hurt Hong Kong. This is going to hurt China, eventually. China has been trying to attract Taiwan people to come to the negotiating table. What you have been doing in Hong Kong certainly destroys Beijing's efforts to appeal to the Taiwan people. And Beijing has been spending tremendous resources to attract Taiwan people. To try to bring them to the negotiating table, 
what China has been doing to Hong Kong has been hurting China's image, China's so-called soft power, China's appeal to the international community. So we are trying to be reasonable. We are trying to tell Beijing that by granting democratic, a democratic system in Hong Kong, it is actually in the benefit of China. However, if Chinese leaders believe that it is willing and it is prepared to pay the price to maintain its monopoly of power, then I'm afraid we, we are going to, uh, to suffer for some years to, to come. This is what we have been trying to, to tell Beijing. And if, if we look at the, a slightly more long-term future for China, certainly we think it is much better for China to introduce political reforms when the party is in charge, when the party enjoys a fairly strong measure of legitimacy, when the economy does well, rather than to disallow political reforms and eventually face a situation of an Arab Spring. But again, one has to be realistic. It is extremely difficult to persuade a Marxist-Leninist regime to give up its monopoly of political power. It's difficult. And uh, as far as we are concerned, Beijing is extremely sophisticated in dealing with us. As we have been saying, uh, our groups have been infiltrated. We can't keep secrets. We are fighting a very, very powerful machinery. It, it taps our phones, hacks our uh, computers, and so on. Now it tries to, uh, to smear against us, to destroy our, our reputation, and so on. And uh, uh, a usual tactic, of course, is collusion with foreign powers. So you have been working together with the Americans to destabilize China and so on. You're not patriotic, etc. So these are the usual, usual tactics. And I am in a slightly better position simply because I'm 65 years old. I, I, uh, I can choose to retire any time. It is much tougher for my colleagues in the 30s, 40s, 50s when they have a family to support, when they have a mortgage to pay for, and so on. It's difficult. So uh, one can understand if they choose not to speak out. Pressures are substantial. And that is also why you have more students than uh, people than working people in their 30s, 40s, and so on. As a political scientist, uh, how do you see the situation in mainland, mainland China in connection with the rest of the world? Because in political crisis at Ukraine, the rest of the world would apply the sanctions, the economical sanctions, but is it possible to apply any kind of sanction to mainland China, to Beijing? Beijing, because as we can see, uh, they smartly invested to the uh, to United States uh, government uh, stocks, etc. And it is hardly to apply any sanctions to them right now. So how, how do you see it as, a, as an expert for the region? Um. The, the present Chinese formula of maintaining uh, regime stability and even regime legitimacy probably has these elements. A, economic growth. Well, we know that it has achieved very substantial, very impressive economic growth, and the regime can claim that it delivers. Uh, people in China 
or the vast vast majority of people in China uh, have been enjoying improvements in living standards in the past 30 years and more and they are afraid of chaos afraid of changes so this explains the stability of the regime then uh, the leadership has been wise enough to have introduced in the past decade and more a basic social security system covering the entire population and this has absorbed this, the uh, the shock of the widening of the gap between the rich and poor as well uh, and the government has been trying to improve governance uh, to to mean to introduce good governance in the absence of democracy so this has been the the formula, formula adopted so far, and one has to admit that it's not too bad. It has been working, and probably you don't expect any serious changes in the coming five years. Uh, major changes probably will take place. We'll wait for another ten years or so. So I have been reading. Uh, Markgraf Havel before coming here in preparation for this talk and um, uh, it was a bit like what he said about your situation in 1975 when he published his open letter to uh, to your president then Dr. Gustav Huzak so he was saying that things seemed to work uh, people were buying houses buying cars and so on, and the economy improved a little bit. So this is a kind of situation in China. So this means that from 75, when he wrote this, this letter, checks had to wait until 1989, 14 years. So I'm afraid we, we probably have to wait for another 10 years. So we, we have to face pretty tough times ahead. But uh, we still want to dream the impossible dream. I think we have uh, time for uh, last questions or comments. Please don't be shy. I will maybe try to ask more general, more general question. Uh, between China and Hong Kong, uh, from outside we can see that there there are two uh, different political systems. But in a way, one can be seen as a kind of uh, state capitalism run by the corporation called Communist Party, and the other is some kind of uh, kind of standard capitalism. Do th do do you see, so for example, in recent uh, also crisis between the, this uh, clash of competences and uh, so on, some ideas for something new coming out, for example, some ideas which would be show uh, some new formations of organizing society or something like this? Um, Hong Kong has not been able to enjoy democracy all the time. But because it has been an international financial center and international business services center, so all parties concerned, including Beijing, including the tycoons, they want to make sure that this place functions. So you need the rule of law to a large extent. You need freedom of information flow. Otherwise, how can you function as an international financial center? So this has been protecting us. This means that this is how we can compete with Shanghai. Otherwise, how can we compete with Shanghai and the coastal cities in China? However, there is a danger here exactly at this point because we dare f fight for democracy. Beijing may say Hong Kong is too troublesome. 
and Beijing may try to make Hong Kong like Shanghai. So this is exactly what I say. We are very worried about being reduced to just another big city in mainland China. And this is the real threat to us, more than fighting for a democratic system. Some of the people in Hong Kong are thinking of emigrating. So, uh, and on the other hand, of course, we are very encouraged to see the young people fighting because uh, they know that their future is at stake and they don't want to be people living in a city like Shanghai. They want to keep that Hong Kong spirit and it requires sacrifices and efforts. I would like to continue on this question. Mm -hmm. When I've met uh, Michael Moore, the US filmmaker, he told me that in the time of uh, the fall of Berlin Wall, he was attending to Berlin Film Festival with his oh. film, and he thought that there will be huge uh, uh, fusion of capitalist system and the socialist system, and that uh, in this new system, uh, people will take the advantages of the socialism and capitalism, and that, there that Eastern Europe will be like a laboratory for creating something new, because as far as he understood capitalism in the US, it is hard system for a lot of people. A lot of people suffers a lot uh, with unemployment and with the, with the negative elements. Do you see from your perspective that uh, Hong Kong would be this kind of laboratory where you would mix uh, the benefits of the international financial center and the benefits of capitalism with uh, some kind of influence which would uh, lead the government in Hong Kong to the some uh, like uh, more social fair system? Is there some kind of discussion going on in between young people doing the revolution there now? Yes. Um, a few years ago, when the young people started various campaigns to protect the heritage of Hong Kong, the old buildings and so on of Hong Kong, the government was surprised. Even the pro-democracy political parties were surprised. They, they neglected these things which the young people cherish. I, I always believe in whatever you call it, socialism with a human face or capitalism with a human face. You, 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 you need a system in which people care, in which people think about higher values than just making money. And I think our, our young people feel it more than our generations that exactly because they know that the opportunities of their becoming rich and so on may, may, may be limited. So they want a life with meaning. Um, you see this happening in, in some ways. Um, you, you may observe that the uh, that the Americans now go to church more frequently than the Poles, probably than the Czechs. Um, that, in fact, the, the hippies' generation who were fighting, who were protesting against the Vietnamese war, they have been returning to the churches in the past decade and more. You go to Taiwan, and you see a lot of highly educated people visiting temples in the weekends, not to seek blessings uh, from the gods to make them rich, but to, to have a better sense of inner peace. So I think we, in, in many ways, we all share this pursuit 
of peace um, with the environment, with the heavens, with our own way of life, and and uh, when people work well, twelve hours a day. This pressure to seek inner peace is probably uh, greater, and uh, just like um, increasingly, people understand that we cannot afford to exploit the earth too much. You you have to change your lifestyle, so it's just the same thing. You 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 have to. To be enlightened, to to change your lifestyle, so that you have, you can secure that meaning in your life, so that you have some satisfaction, true satisfaction in your life, and uh, and I believe in that. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I think to end this uh, wonderful meeting with the idea of inner peace <laughs> and uh, socialism or capitalism or whatever system but with human face is a wonderful idea. So thank you very much yep. to both of you for coming and for great inspirational inspiration forum right. and we wish that uh, the biggest dreams are coming true for all of us. Well, thank I you. I am once again most grateful for this opportunity and Hong Kong is quite far away and and on a Sunday afternoon and I can only say thank you for your interest in Hong Kong. Thank you. <laughs>